I didn't pick up the wrong version. I'm going with the, well, I'll just read it off here. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemies be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had forgotten that I went with the New King James Version this week. I know, for me, the Psalms just have a, a majesty, if you will, in the King James that other versions are, are good, but this one seems to have the most power for me. A long time ago, in a land far, far away, There lived a princess. And this princess had everything that a princess should have. She was beautiful, poet, minstrels, sculptors all trying to capture the essence of this beautiful soul. One day, it all went wrong. She came down with a disfiguring illness. And Try as they might, the poets and the minstrels and the sculptors, they tried to make her beautiful, <coughs> but they couldn't. They couldn't find anything in themselves that said this person is still beautiful. And so she went away to a place where no one knew her. No one had ever seen her as anything other than what she was now. And in this new home, the minstrels and the poets and the sculptors were amazed that such a beautiful soul had come into their midst. And they described her as the most beautiful creature God had ever placed in that land. The first two weeks of Lent, the Psalms that we consider were the songs of, well, orientation. The songs of why we come into the sanctuary of God. Oh, we're oriented towards God. That's what the word religion means. You know, that from ligament, you're reattached to God. And so these opening psalms, a big chunk of the Psalter, talks to us about the glory, the majesty, the, the faithful 
who throng before the throne and before the, the presence of the Almighty. And isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? Wow, that's what it's all about. Until we get to Psalm 13. A big chunk of the Psalter doesn't talk to us about how wonderful God is or how perfect it is in my little my little space. Because at, there are times in your life when things are going so well. I mean, you got the right guy or the right girl or the right haircut. Don't laugh. I saw that. <laughs> There's, you know, everything seems to be falling into our lap that we wanted. You know, you, back, you know those of you old enough to remember the Sears Wish Book. And you, you'd go down and you'd circle every page, something on it, and it happened. Wow. And, you know, you're tiptoeing through the tulips and you're skipping down properly. <laughs> and it's easy to think of well, that bargain that we make with God. If I pay my taxes, if I go to school, if I become a church member, if I if I, if I, then you will do X, Y, and Z. And we make that bargain with God, intentionally or unintentionally, until the wheels come off the way and we get sick or divorced or, or, or. And then, maybe without meaning to, we ask, why me? What did I do? What do I do now? I made a bargain with God that, you know, if I believe, everything's going to be okay. okay? That's, that's kind of what we do. And now things are not okay. Maybe, well, I'm still the same. It must be God's fault. God did this to me. And, you know, some people get disillusioned or disoriented or they just give up. The psalmist that we read this morning had one of those experiences. I want you to imagine singing that and, and no one knows what the music sounded like. But we know that they sang the songs. Imagine you're having one of those really, really cruddy days. Or maybe you're not just having a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. You're having a bad life. And you look around and there's people who seem to have it all. Their life is going great. They, they've married the love of their life and their children are, what, what does Garrison Keeler say? All the children are above average. Yeah. And the barns are full and the cattle are well fed and, you know, life is good. But our life isn't always great. Sometimes each of us, if we're honest with ourselves and with God, there are times in our life where things are not going well. Dr. Seuss uh, the prophet Zeus <laughs> said it in his book, Oh, the place you will go, and sometimes it's not.
Sometimes it just goes wrong. The psalmist who offered the words of how long, O oh God, how long do I have to suffer? How long do I have to go through this? Remembers that the God who called him or her into being is still there, is still faithful, is still loving, despite everything that the world can do. And so the psalmist faced with the options of giving up or getting up ascribes to God his purpose, his plan, and his prayer. To use the oft-quoted line from Abraham Lincoln, I have often found myself on my knees by the realization that I had no place else to go. And so this psalm, this psalm of disorientation, holds out for us that glimmer of hope, that reminder that it will happen. You will be redeemed. Maybe not in the way you expect. Maybe not even in this lifetime. But the eternal word of God, which has never changed. Our experience of God changes. The language we use to describe or saying or to do religious stuff, that changes. But the eternal message, the eternal core of the faith never does. And so the psalmist says to us, I know it's bad. I know it is. But I still believe. I still believe in the goodness of God. The psalmist does not pretend that his life is perfect. Or that believers will never have a bad day. But he dispels the notion that unless you are perfect, unless you are above and beyond reproach, you have no business becoming into the presence of God. Because the psalmist says to us, wherever you are, God is there with you. Whatever you want to be, God is already beckoning you to come. Whatever else is going on in your life, all the changes that are going to happen, all the things that are coming your way in the days you have left, all of that, all of that, place before God. And in God's name, you will trust. So the next time you go out to a restaurant, get a soda, look at your money, and see that minted phrase, in God we trust. Is it just a political statement? that somebody put there during the height of the Cold War to show that we were not like the godless communists? Or does it actually mean something? Does it mean that you really trust God? Because trusting in God is hard work. 
It takes effort. It takes commitment. By trusting in God, you validate God's trust in you. So trust God this day. And see where it gets you. Amen. Amen. Now I'd like you to stand if you are able, as we sing together, God has spoken by the Father.